Hello, this is Pastor Morgan. I want to just uh, thank you for joining me today on this uh, this teaching. I also want to encourage you, first of all, to pray for uh, Western North Carolina. Uh, if you have items, humanitarian aid items, uh, water, what, et cetera, that you'd like to donate, uh, Cornerstone Church, we're, we're collecting those, and then we're, we're coordinating with Fuquay Baptist, we, we have already delivered one load there and they load it up and carry it up, up to the, up to the mountains. So you can, if, you, if it's more, more convenient for you, you can bring that, those items to the church and we'll, we'll take those, uh, down there to, to downtown Fuquay to the, to the Baptist church there. Praise the Lord. Uh, but of course, pray, pray for the people that are suffering there as we stand together in unity and pray for them. And as time goes on, there may be more that we can do as we understand what to do. Uh, but we want to pray that God would uh, take what was meant for evil and that God would turn it for good. One of the things that at the church that we're continually praying for is revival. We, we call it, and God spoke this word to us, was fire in the Carolinas. And so uh, I told my wife this morning, we're praying for fire. Instead, we, we get a flood. Uh, but, but nevertheless, what, what the devil meant for evil, God can turn for good. And so what we want to do is just pray for the people that are there, that in this moment of great crisis, that their hearts have turned and they'd seek the Lord and there'd be out of this tragedy, there would be, be a move of God. There'd be thousands say people would come to Jesus. Amen. And uh, it's our opportunity in the middle of that uh, with unconditional love to do what we can do, what we're able to do, coordinate with others to send aid there. And we want to continue to do that. I also want to, I want to just encourage you to pray, uh, pray for America. We are obviously our election now is about a month away. We want to pray. We have a biblical mandate from God to pray for those that are in our government and those that are in authority. Paul said in first Timothy chapter two, verse, uh, verse one, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men for kings and for all in authority. Now I say in, in the greater sense, regardless of who's in charge, regardless of who's in charge, the kingdom of God is going to move forward. Uh, Jesus said, I'm going to build my, my church at the gates of hell and not prevail against it. But having godly leaders that are uh, in favor of freedom and free speech so that we can do our work as men, uh, as the church, it's actually going to make it a whole lot easier on us. And I'll go back and read that. He said, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness, godliness and honesty. For this is acceptable. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So the whole implication here is, is if we get the right leaders in, we get the right leaders in, godly people, that will create an atmosphere of quietness and peace, then, uh, then what will happen is in that atmosphere, people will get saved. Uh, the implication is the opposite of that. You get the wrong people in, creates a tumultuous, dark, deceptive atmosphere, and there are some people that aren't going to get saved. Uh, nevertheless, the kingdom of God stands sure, the Bible says, we're found on the rock Christ Jesus. But I believe that it's, it's our responsibility as Christians that we are to be light, we are to be salt, uh, Jesus said that very clearly. So we are to pray, pray for those in leadership, pray for the election. Uh, do more than pray for the election. Do some research. Uh, look at the candidates. You know, I know that they're spending millions and millions and millions of dollars through marketing companies to make each one look good and the other look bad. And as, as often th those, uh, those, those, camp those political ads are, are, are geared to move you emotionally and sometimes never really address the, the real subject. Uh, so I just encourage you to just to, uh, you know, find a voter's guide, an unbiased voter's guide. Look at the issues, study the issues. And I would say this, sometimes the highlight is only on the national election. But these local elections matter as well uh, as, we, as they're electing uh, judges and they're, we're electing uh, school board members, etc., uh, don't go to the voting booth without educating yourself so that you can, uh, as a Christian, as a child of God, vote according to, to biblical values 
so that we elect people that will implement those policies, those laws that favor, that favor uh, godliness, that favor peace. Uh, you know, some of these, some of some of what's happening in in our day is we look at it directly. It's quite disturbing, um, and some of the things that are going on in our schools, etc. And so we have an opportunity now to, in the election, to elect the right people that will turn turn that and and go other directions. Uh, I think you know what I'm talking about. You know the uh, the the the, the, tra the transgender thing. Is uh, I, I think it's just a form of of child abuse, and I think that uh, G, what I do know Jesus said it would be better if you offend a little child. The word offend doesn't mean you hurt their feelings. The word offend means you cause to sin. If you cause to sin a little child, it'd be better for you to hang, you you know take a millstone, hang it around your neck, and throw you in the depth of the sea. Jesus said that. Uh, so if Jesus, you know, gentle, loving Jesus said that, you can imagine. Uh, you know, how, how, how terrible, how terrible he views that. So we need to stand up for, for, for godliness. We need to stand up for holiness and we need to stand up for biblical principles in our, in our day. And again, I, I believe you need to, you need to research, you need to research every level of election. You go to the voting booth armed with knowledge so that you're not, you know, you're not any, many, mighty, mo. And, and just voting, you don't really know who you're voting for. You need, you need to go, you need to arm yourself. So you can do that. Um, so there are issues, and one of the issues that I see continuous, continuously now on, on the, uh, you know, on the political ads, I, and I said, I said it on Sunday or Sunday before that, I said it, it, it obviously because, you know, Roe versus Wade was overturned, and they kicked back the decision on abortion back to the states. And so now states have to decide. And so, uh, as, as, as the church, uh, we are a prophetic voice and we say to our state, we say to our nation, uh, that, uh, that this, that abortion is wrong. And while we, we have love and compassion for people that are, that are, uh, that are affected by whatever situation they may be going through, uh, abortion is, is wrong. It's sin. And the Bible's very clear on that point. It's very clear. There's no, there's no, there's no gray area on the matter. Uh, when we understand, and I, I want to just deal with that for just a few moments here, right out of the Bible, because it's important in the light of man. As a, I mean, practically every time we we cut the, you know, cut the TV on or or watch some news or or even cut on a, a YouTube video, these these political ads are popping up. And uh, uh, I have to say that it, uh, I just feel like I, I want I want to share this for just a few moments. And uh, this will give you a, a biblical background to, uh, to what God, God's word says. Now, we've got to go back to creation. The Bible records the creation of Adam and Eve. And uh, you, know this, you know how it says, but I'll read it. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And so if you have a Genesis chapter 1 creation uh, basis as your, as your belief, then there are only two genders. There's, there's only two genders. It's male and female. Uh, it's very clear here. Uh, so you can imagine the level of deception that is in operation in our day when they have, you know, they have so many, supposed to so many genders. So, so God says he, he created man his own image and likeness and blessed them. And God said to them, verse 28, Genesis 128, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. So we have God giving to man the mandate to, with, with the blessing, to be fruitful and to multiply and replenish the earth. And you get to Genesis chapter 2, God gives it into the detail of how he created. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathing his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So the Bible said God formed man. It means to squeeze into shape. The word form means to squeeze into shape. So it's, so it's like God took the dirt, put, put, used his own hands, Pulled the dirt together and he squeezed into shape this man. And then he, then he breathed in his nostrils the breath of life. And the Bible said man became a living soul. So that was the man Adam. And so it was after that, verse 21, the Bible says, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman 
and brought her into the man. So now we, we understand how God created the woman. He took the rib out of the man's side, put Adam to sleep, took a rib out of his side, and from that rib, he created a woman, and then he brought her to him and uh, got himself officiated. God was the matchmaker, and then he officiated the wedding ceremony, and Adam and Eve got married right there in the middle of that garden. <laughs> Amen. Um, but here is the question. But how did creation of the human race continue? Because God has said to them that they were to be fruitful and multiply, which means obviously they were to have children. And so Genesis chapter 4, verse 1 is the first human being that comes into this earth through childbirth. And we begin there. The Bible records the conception and the birth of Cain. And the Bible says, Genesis 4, 1, And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived, and there's Cain, and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. Now, it's interesting here that the Bible celebrates the Bible records, the Bible celebrates the conception of Cain. Now, you know, in our day, you know, we have birthdays and, uh, you know, the, our, our, our children, our grandchildren come to that birthday. And that's a special day, man. And we get them a cake and we have balloons and presents and, and call friends over and we celebrate their birthday. And so shall, so we should. But God being God knows the very moment that that child was conceived and God celebrates the moment of conception. <laughs> he celebrates the moment of conception. He also celebrates the moment of birth. Now, I want to flip through here and I'm going to come back to some of those scriptures, but I'm going to go over here to the book of Job for a moment. In the book of Job, Job, obviously at this point in Job chapter 3, I'm in Job 3, verses 2 and 3, Job is going through a very, very difficult time in his life as you know. and uh, But let's read what he says here. And Job spake and said, let the day perish when I was born and the night in which it was said, well, listen to that, and the night in which it was said, there is a man child conceived. Now stop right there. Who said that? In other words, Job is referring to the day that he was born He's also referring to the night, he says, that he was conceived. <laughs> and, and he said, and it was said, it was said, there's a man child conceived. Now, who said that? There is a man child conceived. Who said that? Well, nobody knows, nobody knows, uh, the, the, the husband and the wife, they're there together, but they don't know, they don't, they don't know the moment of conception. They don't, they don't know. Uh, they, they don't know. I won't go into detail on that, but, but they, they don't know. Uh, but who said that? God said that. God said that. God said that. There is a man child conceived. Amen. A husband and wife, they've come together. And God said, there's a man child conceived. He said that about, he said that about Job. And so there is a celebration in heaven the moment that there is a conception of a man child. You know, when God looks upon this earth, the most valuable thing on this earth is not the gold, not the silver, not the trees, not the, not the water, not the air. The most valuable thing on this earth, God, is people, is, is people. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You know that. But God had it intentionally created man in his own image, in his own likeness, because this man... God has the heart of a father, and this man, Adam, was going to be his son, and they, he was going to have a family. The Bible speaks about the father and his family. We are in the family of God. Hallelujah. And so God, God being a father, wanted a family, and that's why he created Adam. And every time that there is a child conceived, there's a celebration in the heaven. There's a man child conceived. Amen. And so heaven, heaven uh, responds to that. And so Genesis chapter 4 verse 1 is really showing us that. He said, Adam, and Eve, Adam knew his wife and she conceived and bare Cain. So conceptions record. Let me just go through the Bible here. I'll make a few comments as we go through uh, several verses. Genesis 14, 17. And Cain knew his wife and she conceived and bare Enoch. Again, they're celebrating conception. Uh, Abraham and Hagar with Ishmael. 
uh, was conceived and born. And the Bible says, Genesis 16, 4, and he, Abraham, went in unto Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her, her mistress was despised in her eyes. Uh, Genesis chapter 21, verse 2, Abraham and Sarah, when Isaac was conceived. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age at the set time in which God had spoken to him. Genesis chapter 25, verse 21, Isaac and Rebekah with the conception and birth of Esau and Jacob. And Esau entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. She was unable to have children up until that moment. And the Lord was entreated of him and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. And the children and the children struggled together within her. So the Bible refers to those children that are still within her. God regards them as children. You know, in our day, we've changed the name, make it sound not, not sound so bad. They call it a fetus. But the Bible calls it children. And the children, Esau and Jacob, and the children struggled together within her. Now stop and look at that. God says that they are children and they're struggling within her. While they're still inside of their mother's womb, God calls them children. And she said, if it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. The children struggled together within her. So God calls them, God calls them children. He knows them. He knows them. And we'll get to that in just a minute. Genesis chapter 29, verse 32. And Leah conceived, this is Reuben, and Leah conceived and bare a son, and she called his name Reuben. Genesis 29, verse 33. And she conceived again and bare a son, and she said, and this one was called uh, Simeon. Genesis 29, verse 34, Levi. And she conceived again and bare a son and said, now this time, and she, and she continues. Uh, Genesis 29, verse 35, Judah, and she conceived again and bare a son. Uh, then, then, then you go to Genesis 30, verse 5, Jacob and Bilhah, Dan is born, and, and Bilhah conceived and bare Jacob a son. Genesis 30, verse 7, uh, Jacob and Bilhah, uh, Naphtali, and Bilhah, Rachel's maid, conceived again and bare Jacob a second son. So again and again and again and again and again, he's recording conception. Genesis 30, verse 17, Jacob and Leah, Issachar, and, and God hearkened to, unto Leah, and she conceived and bare Jacob the fifth son. Uh, Genesis 30, uh, uh, 19, Jacob and Leah, and Leah conceived again and bare Jacob the sixth son, that was Zebulun. Genesis 30, verse 23, Jacob and Rachel with Joseph, and she conceived and bare a son and said, God had taken away my reproach. And then... Uh, uh, you have in Genesis chapter 38 when uh, Judah now has grown up and he gets he, he marries a wife. And verse 3 said, and she conceived and bare a son. Verse 4 said, and she conceived again and bare a son. And verse 5, and she conceived again and bare a son. Uh, and then we jump up to Exodus chapter chapter 2, verse 2. It says, and there went a man of the house of Levi and took a wife, a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. That was Moses. So it records the moment of Moses' conception and then records his birth. Samuel, 1 Samuel one twenty. Wherefore it came to pass when the time was come after that Hannah had conceived that she bare a son and called his name Samuel. And so, you know, you could continue and continue on here throughout throughout the Bible. And again and again, it talks about the moment, the moment of conception. Then we get to the New Testament, Luke chapter 1, 24. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth, speaking about uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth. Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying, uh, Luke one thirty one, and behold, uh, thou shalt conceive in thy womb. So this is the angel coming to the Virgin Mary and announcing the fact that she is going to conceive. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. And uh, Luke one thirty six, and behold, thou cousin Elizabeth, she also con hath conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her who is called, who is called barren. Now, we, we see that 36 times in the, in, the, in the Bible, it records the moment of conception of the child, thus demonstrating and showing us that God recognizes and celebrates the moment of conception. And actually, life begins at conception. Uh, because what you're going to see here in the next few moments that God, God sees the person, God sees the person, uh, God sees the person even before, uh, that person's body is formed. 
Uh, so so you, you, when you have a conception, it's not just a physical thing, it's a spiritual thing. Because man is made in the image and the likeness of God. He's a spiritual being, and he's not just a body. Matter of fact, one of these days, you know, you, you and I, we're going to leave our body, and but yet we're going to still be alive, and we're going to go to heaven. But at the moment of conception, at the moment of conception, there is life. There is life, and that life is from God, and uh and, and so it happens at conception. And God, God, God gives life. But now listen to this. Now this is interesting, okay? Jeremiah, because after conception, the hand of God begins forming that child in the womb. Jeremiah chapter one, verse five. God says to Jeremiah, before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. Stop right there. So in the mind of God, Jeremiah was already a person before he had a body. Now, I don't know. You'll have to figure that one out, but this is what it says. God says, before I formed you in the belly, he's talking about his body. Before your body was formed, before your body was formed in the belly, I knew you. And before you came out of, of the fourth out of the womb, I sanctified you and ordained you a prophet into the nation. So, so before the, the, the young, before Jeremiah was ever born, God had already sanctified him, separated him and dedicated him to a holy purpose. God had sanctified him and ordained him to be a prophet. God had already planned his destiny. God had already planned his ministry. God had already allocated to him the anointing. Amen. It was already his. So we see that God formed before I, God formed thee in the belly. Now, here's the interesting thing. We go back to Genesis chapter 2. And verse, uh, verse seven, God, and the Lord God formed man from the dust of the earth, formed. And we look here, Jeremiah 1, 5, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew you. So in the garden, God took his own hands and he formed the dust out into a man. But here God tells us in Jeremiah 1, 5, the same thing is happening, except it's happening inside the womb of that woman. It's being formed. It's the same, it's the same word. It means to squeeze into shape. So the hand of God, God said, I formed you. The hand of God, there's a conception, and then the hand of God begins forming that child inside of the womb. Inside of the womb. Now, let's go to, uh, let's go to Psalms, Psalms 139, Psalms 139, and I'm going to, I'm going to read this in the, in the Amplified version and may refer to a couple other versions. But uh, amplif I'll start with the, the ICB version, okay? Psalms 139, and I'll just read two verses here, verses 13 and 14. So these are some of the most beautiful scriptures in the Bible uh, with God, God, God showing his affection for you. God showing his affection for people, but that begins long before they're born. Uh, God knows them. God's got a plan for their life, and uh, it, it starts long before they're born. He says, look, look at this, Psalms 139 Verse 13 and 14, this, I'll start with the ICB. God, and it says, you made my whole being. You formed me in my mother's body. So the moment of conception, God begins forming that baby inside, inside of the mother's body. God is involved in the formation of that child. He said, I praise you because you made me in an amazing and wonderful way. What you've done is wonderful. And I know this very well. Okay, let me read, let me read this translation, Psalm 139. You formed my innermost being, shaping my delicate inside and my intricate outside and wove them. He said, you did this, God, and wove them all together in my mother's womb. The hand of God was forming the child hidden in the secret place of the mother's womb. Uh, wove them together, it says. So God is weaving them together, weaving that body together. He said, I thank you, God, for making me so mysteriously complex. Everything you do is marvelously breathtaking. It simply amazes me to think about it, how thoroughly you know me, Lord. You even formed every bone in my body when you created me in the secret place, carefully, skillfully shaping me from nothing to something. The secret place being the womb of the mother. You saw who you, saw who you created me to be before I became me. Before I'd ever seen the light of day, the number of days you planned for me were already recorded in your book. Every single moment you were thinking of me, how precious and wonderful to consider that you cherished me constantly in every thought. 
Oh God, your desires toward me are more than the grains of sand on every shore. When I wake each morning, you're still with me. So, so when, the, when that baby is conceived, God begins forming that, that baby inside and out. At the same moment, God in his, his love, God in his love for that child already has a calling, already has a plan, has already detailed plans of that child's future already laid out. Already laid out. Now, now what we, what we were told before is that it's just a, just a glob of tissue. People would say it's just a glob of tissue, but that was actually also disproved by science itself with the invention of the ultrasound. Because when they took the ultrasound and began to look at these children in the womb, some one of the most disturbing things you can see, I think the, the video is called the silent screen, where, they, where, the, where that instrument is inserted up into that mother in order to perform that abortion. And that child obviously has fearful emotions and is reacting, trying to get away from that, that instrument that, that is being used to perform the abortion. Now, I say all that to say this, I really feel like it would serve everybody well if you would read the book of Isaiah and the book of Jeremiah and you would begin to connect those books to the gospels and the preaching of Jesus as he addressed the nation of Israel. Um, you, you're going to see, you're going to see that, that, uh, that that's some pretty serious stuff that, that Isaiah and Jeremiah are talking about it being, being prophets to the nation of Israel, but not only prophets to the nation of Israel, but being prophets to the nations. And that uh, the, 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 the effect and the result of their sin is bringing, is bringing destruction upon them. And uh, one of the key elements throughout those two books that of Israel's sin in those days is the fact that God says over and over again that they've shed innocent blood. And I believe today that, uh, that as Americans, I believe we need to repent for our nation. I think we also need to, to uh, but now that this thing is kicked back to the state, so the state of North Carolina, I believe the Church of, Church of Jesus Christ in North Carolina has to, has to look at the Bible and say, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is not right. This is not right. We're going to love everybody. If you've had an abortion, we're going to love you. God forgives you. And I believe you can become a voice Moving forward for those that have, uh, have ha are, are thinking about having an abortion. Uh, and, uh, and we can, we can, uh, we can, uh, see God work through us to stop this. Uh, you say, Pastor, it'll never stop. Nothing will ever change. Well, uh, at least we lifted up our voice. At least we sounded an alarm. At least we were watchmen on the wall that God put us to serve our generation, serve it well. And tell them the truth. It's a it's a lie. It's a lie that uh, that you can have an abortion and have no lingering effects. And and it, it's a sin. It's 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 you're killing a child. It, they're killing a child. And so uh, when I understand the Bible, then I can't be quiet. I can't be silent. I've had to, I've got I have to say something. I have to say something and help somebody maybe make the right decision. And maybe even help somebody make a right decision when it comes to the vote. And we, again, we may disagree on, on which candidate, which, which particular candidate is going to do the right thing, but at least we know what the right thing is. And we can at least agree to pray together, uh, to pray together to see a change and see revival. See, when we talk about revival, we talk about fire in the Carolinas. We're talking about, we're talking about people getting radically saved radically born again, transformed and turning away from the world and begin to preach and, and, and witness and pray for people in the power of the spirit. Amen. And those people are going to be people that, that have just draw the line and say, we're not going to compromise. We're going to stand for the truth and we're going to love everybody. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I love you. I want to pray for you today. I believe God's going to help you and me and all of us do the right thing in this hour. And uh, so let me pray for you. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I pray for everybody right now. Lord, as we discuss these scriptures, Lord, you call us to pray for those in authority. And we pray for those that are in authority and we pray for the election and God, those that will, that will be in authority. We pray, God, that they would uh, serve and that they would administer under the fear of God and the wisdom of God. 
directed by the hand of God. Lord, your word says the hand of the king is in the hand of the Lord who turns it wheresoever he will. So Lord, we're asking you, O oh God, that you would turn the heart of the king toward the children, Lord God, in Jesus' name. And Lord, I pray that uh, this young generation, this young generation, God will rise up in the power of the Holy Spirit. God, you said the last days I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Lord, let this generation, God, let, let them experience the outpouring of the Holy Ghost like never before. Lord, you've said you'd do it. I believe you're doing it. And God, I, I just, just, we just humble ourselves before you, oh God, and ask you to use us, God. And we, we repent for our nation. We repent for the sin of our nation, God. Lord, and I pray, God, that there'd be a change and there'd be revival and there'd be more voices to speak out and tell the truth about the issue. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. I love you. God bless you. Bye-bye.